Greetings, brethren, all around the world. It's very good to be able to talk to you like this at the beginning of the feast. God has blessed this work very, very much, and we're going ahead, we're growing, but we should have a very wonderful and exciting feast. But I'm going to take some time a little later to tell you about the early days of the Feast of Tabernacles, as well as tell you the overall meaning of the feast this very first night. I'll try to keep it short so you can get plenty of rest tonight. But I want to give you some information about how this feast began in our age. As Mr. Ames said one time, I will talk, I said, I can give you the early history. And he said, Rod, you are history. And that's true. I'm the only one left from the early days who lived back in the early days of this work with Mr. Herbert Armstrong. So I'll tell you about how the feast was back then and how we ended up keeping it today in the Church of God today. So I hope that can help you and you young people can listen carefully. You may hear things tonight that you'll never hear again because at age 86, I may not be here again. This might be my last feast. I'm not trying to make you feel sorry. I've had a wonderful life, a full life. I've had two beautiful wives. I've had six children, 10 grandchildren, four great grandchildren. So 20 people have proceeded for me, plus my sister Catherine, Mrs. Ames, and many other fine relatives. And I'm very grateful for the family, the extended family I have, and for all of you, my brethren. So I've had a good life. But God does not promise us eternal life in this flesh, as you know. That's one reason I'm bringing Mr. Weston in here, and I hope all of you get acquainted with him. He's been a very, very fine man and able to serve God's people now for over 40 years, full time in the work of God, always been faithful and dedicated, and most important of all in this role, a very able administrator. He can spot problems. He was willing to face those problems and solve those problems. And I'm sure he will be a big problem solver and wonderful help here in, in our headquarters in Charlotte as each month goes on. But brethren, why are we here? As Mr. Herbert Armstrong used to say so many times at the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, why are we here? Luke chapter 4, Jesus Christ said in verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So we're to live by every word of God, not some of the words of God, but all of the words of God. And my brethren, most of you know that Jesus constantly referred to the Old Testament as Scripture. He used that term again and again. So the Old Testament is the word of God, and we're to live by what God tells there, and that it's as magnified and showed that we're to keep it in the New Testament, which we certainly do. We check up on that. But all the Word of God came from God as inspired by Almighty God. It gives us a pattern of life, a way we ought to be living. Also back in Galatians 2 and verse 20, my favorite verse in the Bible, as you know, the apostle wrote, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Remember those phrases, brethren, Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the apostle, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ. So we're to have Christ's faith in us and live by his faith. That's the way of life we're to live, and we're not to try some different way of life. Hebrews chapter 13, turn to Hebrews chapter 13 if you're not familiar with it, in verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In his life, as most all of you know, he kept the Sabbath day always, as his custom was. He kept the annual holy days. He said as the example, that's what true Christianity is all about. This world's been deceived on Christianity. They've been deceived on almost every aspect of Christianity. That's one reason they're getting into same-sex marriage and all this transgender stuff and stuff that, frankly, most of you and your parents and grandparents would have considered absolutely insanity 10 or 25 years ago, yet people are accepting it as normal today, and the media has jumped on the bandwagon, all these television and radio reporters, they want this stuff. They want this. They're trying to deceive us. They're trying to deceive our young people. We've got to help them to know what sanity is, face reality. We're made male and female. We're made for a certain reason. We're made in the image of God. We're to learn to be like God and honor Him. And that's what God's Christian life is all about. 
So we need to understand that. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He set us the example. Turn with me back to John chapter 7. We'll begin to see some of that example. The Gospel of John chapter 7 and verse 1. John writes, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. He was not just imitating the Jews. He constantly condemned their traditions. He said, you keep the traditions of men instead of the commandments of God. Remember that over and over, Jesus condemned that. So he wasn't just following the traditions of men. He was following the law of God, the way of God, setting us an example. And so now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. It calls it the Jews' Feast to let us know what it was. It was the feast the Jews were keeping, the Gentiles weren't keeping it. And his brothers therefore said to him, Depart and go to Judea, that your disciples may see the works you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers, his own physical brothers, did not believe him. They did later. As you know, both John and James became very, very dedicated servants of God and, and extremely dedicated. And the apostle James, and Jude, I should say, not John, later became leading apostles at Jerusalem. And James began to be the leader at the Jerusalem church. But even his physical brothers did not believe in him. No one does anything in secret, so he's, his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. They were a part of this world. His brothers were. They were not converted. They did not understand. And God didn't give his spirit until after Christ's death, as you know. So they certainly don't have God's spirit or God's understanding. For the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. Here was the Son of God the one who had been with God from eternity, the one who said, let there be light, and there was light, the one who spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as the God of the Old Testament, the one who gave the Sabbath, the one who gave the holy days. What's he saying? He told his brothers, not some pagan thing. He would never do that. He was God. He said, you go up to this feast. They were supposed to do that. That was God's command. You go up to this feast, I am not going up yet, for my time has not yet come. When he had said these things, he remained in Galilee, but his brothers went up, and then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret, because he knew that the Jews might try to kill him on the way, or kill him when he first got there. So he went up quietly, secretly. Suddenly he appears in front of the crowd, for it was too late to stop him, at the middle of the feast. Verse 14. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So he taught God's people during the Feast of Tabernacles. He kept the feast. He was there. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never learned? Jesus answered, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So God sent him, and he was teaching God's doctrines, not following their teachings. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whatever it is from God, or whether I speak of my own authority. So Christ was setting us an example, and he was doing what God Almighty said to do. And he was the light of the world, brethren. Always think of that when you think about true Christianity. Don't ever let people mess up your minds like they ha happened in our previous association where they jumped back into mainstream Protestantism. Some people have never proved these things. What is Christianity? True Christianity is following Christ. True Christianity is letting Christ live his life within us, the same life he lived 1,900 years ago, setting us an example. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he kept the Sabbath, we should keep the Sabbath. If he kept the Feast of Tabernacles, we should keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So we need to understand. So anyway, Christ kept the Feast of Tabernacles and went up and preached to them. He was right there with them and setting us an example in doing that. Now let's turn, if you would, back to John chapter 14. I mean, Zechariah, the book of Zechariah in your Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 14. And this is a prophetic book, as you know, coming right on over into the New Testament. 
and telling us things to do in the New Testament as well as the Old. It says in Zechariah 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. We know when that is. The day of the Lord encompasses that period of time before the tribulation, during the tribulation, after the tribulation, and clear on through the millennium until the new heavens and the new earth. All of that is described as being part of the day of the Lord when God intervenes in human affairs and it's coming. It's already beginning to happen. It's coming soon. Christ is coming soon. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem and they shall be taken. The city shall be taken. The houses rifled. The women ravished. Half of the city should go into captivity. That's interesting. The city's already divided today between the Arabs and the Jews. It's already being prepared for this. Half the city should go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. When Christ comes back to this earth, he's going to come back as a warrior. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. I used to wonder, well, why is Christ going to rule with a rod of iron? Because the Methodist Sunday school class always had him pictured as a kind of a weak-looking young man with a long hair sitting sideways on a mule or something. No, he was a strong, vigorous young carpenter, and he had power, physical power, and most of all, spiritual power. He's coming back as the Lord God of the armies of Israel. He's coming back to fight, and he will win. Remember, brethren, we are winners. We are winners. We are going to win if we're on Christ's side. Never lose sight of that. We will be persecuted as Jesus was. We will be harassed. We will be called all kinds of names. Some of us will be beaten up and thrown in jail. But we are winners. In the end, we will win. Christ will be with us. Christ will come back, and he will bless us, deliver us, and reward us forever. So we need to really understand that and have faith in that, to know that God is God and he will cause these things to happen. So his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives when Christ comes back. And it says in verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. When he comes back, he will be king, king of kings and lord of lords, as it tells us in Revelation chapter 19. Now notice, beginning in verse 16, the story flow goes on. Verse 16, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations in this coming battle, which came against Jerusalem, shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Who is that? It says it shall come to pass that everyone, that's quite a statement, everyone who is left, of all the nations, and they all came up, it tells. So they're all going to come up to keep, not to watch the Jews keep, but they will come up and they will be forced to keep the Feast of Tabernacles until they understand what it means and killing and keep it willingly and joyfully. And it shall be that that which ever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king. It's a matter of worship. We're worshiping God in this special time. It pictures his spiritual harvest he has an early harvest pictured by the Passover and Pentecost, and then he has the late harvest. The late harvest is when he sets his hand to save the whole world, and we're rejoicing in that in this festival, as most of you know. So we come up to worship the king, and then there will be no rain if they don't come up. If the family of Egypt will not come up to enter in, they shall have no rain. No rain on any nation that has not come up to worship and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and then they shall receive the plague. God will not only give them no rain, He will cause a plague to come on on, that, on the nations which do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's powerful. That shows how powerfully God feels about this. This shall be the punishment, verse 19 of Egypt, and the punishment of all the nations do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, brethren, this is a very paramount, paramount issue in God's mind. Very important to God Almighty. He will punish nations with complete drought and finally a plague if they will not come up. And Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we do need to understand that and know this. Very, very important to God. 
Now turn with me to Revelation 2, if you would. Revelation chapter 2, brethren. This describes the, last, the third from the last church era, the church era just before, before the Philadelphia era. Revelation, I'm sorry, chapter 3. Revelation 2 tells about the earlier eras. And Revelation chapter 3, the angel of the church of Sardis writes, it was coming just before Philadelphia, and right after the Philadelphia era comes the, the uh, uh, Laodicean era, which we're in. And most of us feel we are the remnant of Philadelphia left over in the Laodicean era. And we've got to keep that Philadelphia spirit. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man's opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. We have kept on the truth. But it says back in chapter 3, verse 1, to the church of Sardis, these things says the word of God. I know that your works, that you have a, the name, that you are alive, but you're dead. He tells the Sardis people, you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Wow. Those people of the previous era, just before Mr. Armstrong came along, they had bits and pieces of the truth, but they were just sort of farmers and having a kind of a fall festival, which they called it sometimes on just a, a week, not a four, eight day festival. Often they just had it at a different time. They didn't even call it the Feast of Tabernacles. They got all of God's laws messed up. They didn't understand their national identity. They didn't know who we are. All kinds of things they did not know. They did not know that God was reproducing himself. God raised up this man, Herbert W. Armstrong, to bring us to the full truth. And he began to reveal through him the meaning of these festivals, how we're to keep all seven of them, and what they meant. The Sardis church never did that. They would keep some of them, but often at the wrong time in the wrong way. He said, you're dead, dead, but strengthen the things which remain, which are about to die. Wow, what a, what a con condemnation. But then he says to this Philadelphia era, which was Mr. Armstrong's era that God used him to raise up, he said, I'm giving you the key of David, which is a matter of right government, because David's going to be the king over all the nations of Israel in tomorrow's world. David was the benchmark God used for all the other kings of Israel. And he says, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. God often speaks of doors as many a way to preach the truth in Ephesus or in Sardis, I mean, in, in Corinth or any place else. God set before Mr. Armstrong the door of radio, the, day, the door of printing presses, and finally the door of television. And Mr. Armstrong went through that door. He did not go through the door of the internet. That door didn't even open up. There wasn't such a thing before Mr. Armstrong's death. But he went through all the other doors and God has since opened up the door of the internet to us as well. And we need to use that door far more powerfully because it's beginning to, it's beginning to bypass the mainstream radio and printing press type of way of reaching people. I've said before you an open door, no man can shut it, for you have a little strength. You've kept my word and have not denied my name, which means God's way, God's authority, everything God stands for. Brethren, we want to honor God. We want to do what God says. We want to show God that we will obey him so he can give us eternal life as kings and priests in his kingdom forever. So we've got to go through the doors. We've got to do what God says. Indeed, I will make take those of the synagogue of Satan who are Jews, say they're Jews and are not, pretending to be spiritual Jews, and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. We have in this church, brethren, the living church of God, we have persevered in that way of life which we were taught by Mr. Armstrong, and we're still doing the work, we're still preaching the full truth, and we're keeping God's festivals in the way God said, I'll take those, 
I, I have, because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world, the coming great tribulation which will come upon the whole world. We are winners. If you obey God, if you follow those of us who have followed God, you will be blessed, you will be protected, and God will bring you into his eternal, in his eternal kingdom forever. So you need to really appreciate that because you've kept my command to persevere, he says. Behold, I come quickly. So Christ is coming quickly on that age. Hold fast that you have that no one take your crown. Don't let anyone take your crown, he says. We've got to do what God says and honor God in all these things. And I certainly hope all of you feel that way and that's what you want to do. So we've got to follow the example that God gave through Christ. And Mr. Armstrong had the fear of God in a profound way. And he was willing to do what God said. If you read his autobiography, you know that his own wife, Loma Armstrong, helped him to see the Sabbath. And he had to dig into the Bible day and night and night and day, over and over for months, literally saturating his mind with the Bible. He did just make this up. I have talked to Mrs. Armstrong. I've talked to even some of their carnal children, their friends. They said, yes, indeed, Mr. Armstrong did that. He drove himself to study this book, the Bible. He tried to saturate his mind with the Bible to find what God really said. And God used that man to raise up the Philadelphia era of God's church. And I'm the only leading minister left from that era to teach you the truth. So I hope you'll listen to what I have to say and pay attention for your eternal good. And now, brethren, before we go on, I'd like to go back and review a little bit of the early days because God used Mr. Armstrong to set the pattern of keeping the feast and he showed us how to keep it. I had the opportunity to keep some of the earliest feasts of this era of the church. I was at the Feast of Tabernacles with Mr. Herbert Armstrong back in 1949, 1950, and 1951, three years up in Belknap Springs, Oregon. And we had a wonderful feast. We only had about 50 people there the first year, about 60, about 90, the final year there, a small group but they were very dedicated. We roughed it. Many of us lived in cabins with no showers and no central heating. It was cold autumn, but nevertheless, we enjoyed it. There was a sense of exhilaration because we sensed we were learning truths, precious truths that the world did not understand at all. And we all came together in a great big uh, log area there where they had this big lodge and a great big uh, stone fireplace and we had long meetings with Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong, Herbert W. Armstrong, was preaching every single sermon, 17 sermons, the opening night plus morning and evening, all through the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day, 17 sermons in a row. He read over and over from this book, all the basic way of God. He read things that we needed to know from Gibbons Rome, about the fall of the Roman Empire and how the truth got taken over by the pagans. He read the two Babylons. He read things from other books like that that be of help to us. And it was very interesting. We had a whole education from that man, 17 solid sermons through the Feast of Tabernacles, three years in a row. And he went through the whole thing. I can never forget it. That first feast in 1949 was a turning point in my life because I'd grown up in a mainstream church. I didn't understand anything, you might say. I just knew that we ought to keep the commandments. And I knew that Mr. Armstrong seemed to really understand prophecy, but I didn't understand many details at all. But after eight days of the feast, I did understand 17 sermons. What a change. God used him to raise up the Philadelphia era to go through open doors of radio and the printing press and public campaigns, and finally the Church of God, when I came to college, and when I graduated from college three years later, because I'd had a year of college in Missouri first, when I graduated in 1952, we still just had three churches, Portland, Eugene, and Pasadena. We still only had about 150 or 200 members attending, not many more than when I first came. It didn't begin to grow until after some of us graduated, 
but that was what Mr. Armstrong wanted. He knew he had to train young men who would be faithful, and he did. And then we went out on baptizing tours all across the United States and Canada. We got hundreds more people attending. So the Feast of Tabernacles was from about 50 to 70 to 90 in Belknap Springs. We then went up to Sigler Springs in Northern California in 1950, and we had about 400 people there. But that's all we had on the whole earth. There was no Feast of Tabernacles back east of there. There's no Feast of Tabernacles in Canada, no Feast of Tabernacles in Great Britain. That was it, 400 people in Sigler Springs. Then the next year, we went to Big Sand in the old Tabernacle building, and it was open-sided then. They hadn't even finished putting the sides on. I remember Dick and Armstrong and I were sitting together and shivering because the cold winds were coming in. But boy, we were hearing the truth. And by that time, we were helping to preach some ourselves at the Feast of Tabernacles when the feast was finally moved to Sigler Springs, I mean to, to Big Sandy in 1951. And we didn't have suddenly the Feast of Tennis jumped up at that point to about 700 people, 700 or 750 at that point, and began to grow and grow. Finally, we realized that that was not going to be enough. We had people in Britain. We had people around the world being converted. And I was able to talk to Mr. Armstrong flying back from England on January the 4th, 1961, Margie sat with Mrs. Herbert Armstrong. She agreed to switch so I could sit with Mr. Armstrong. And Dr. Hay and I had gone through this, and I was teaching epistles class and explained to Mr. Armstrong, there's no way all the Gentiles could come to Jerusalem back then. They must have had more than one feast site in the early church. So he agreed, and we sent Les McCullough and Ron Kelly up to Northern California and eventually found the feast site at Squaw Valley. So the feast at Squaw Valley began that very autumn, the autumn of 1961. And then we began to expand from Squaw Valley back to Jekyll Island a couple of years later. And then other feast sites up in, up in Pennsylvania, the Poconos, other feast sites in, in Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri, and other feast sites all around the world as God caused the feast to grow. And I was part of that. I helped do that. I helped David select the feast site at Squaw Valley. Very grateful for that opportunity. But God used us to help Mr. Armstrong because he was determined to do what God said. He always was. He tried to do what God said, even when it was unpleasant. He tried to obey God. And brethren, that's why we're here because he and Mrs. Armstrong had the courage to break from the majority, to be willing to obey God and do what God said. And in those early feasts at Big Sandy, there was a sense of excitement, a sense of electrifying services, and people were coming in from all over, camping in the area there, in tents all over that big grounds area we had. And they were excited, though. They were glad to rough it. They were, of course, it was a different age than where you're living in. We didn't have all these big hotel chains and motel chains like Holiday Inn and all these others across the country. They weren't there then. They were just barely starting. Most of them didn't even exist. So we were willing to live in tents and temporary motels and hotels, often small ones and not good ones, and be willing to obey God and be in that festival at Big Sandy and then elsewhere and there was a sense of excitement. We were learning a way of God, and the church grew and grew and grew instead of having finally, when I graduated from college, I said we finally had about 150 or 200 in the whole church, counting Pasadena, Eugene, and Portland, and others. Now, instead of maybe 200 people, we finally got up to over 150,000 people at the peak because Mr. Armstrong had taught us that way of life, and God blessed and blessed and blessed. But then some bad guys came in, in the greatest apostasy in human history, in modern times at least, and turned the church aside, and they went back to mainstream Protestantism. The church went away. God took away the blessings. He took away that sense of excitement, and it's coming apart. But we are carrying on, and you and I will be blessed if we fight for the truth, if we keep carrying on, if we put our faith and trust in the living Christ, he will lead us and guide us and bring us into the eternal kingdom. So we want to really understand that and be very grateful that we have the opportunity to keep the Feast of Tabernacles 
and picture God's plan and rejoice in what God tells us to do. Turn with me now back to Deuteronomy, if you would. Deuteronomy 16, brethren. Deuteronomy chapter 16. And let's begin in verse 1. Deuteronomy, your Old Testament 16. Here's what God says. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. Your God brought you out of the Egypt by night. So he tells us to observe the Passover with the Lord. And then he said in verse uh, 3, you'll eat no leavened bread with it, and you're to have seven days of unleavened bread. So those are the two first feasts, picturing Christ's sacrifice for us. That's the beginning. Then we come out of sin. Leaven is a type of sin. We put leaven out of our home. We grow in grace and in knowledge. And then the third feast, of course, was the feast of Pentecost, the feast of first fruits, picturing the fact we're all first fruits today. And then in the autumn, the Feast of Trumpets, picturing Christ coming at a time of war, the alarm of war pictured by trumpets, and then the Day of Atonement, and then the sixth feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And God says here in verse 13, Deuteronomy 16, verse 13, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. We're commanded to do that by God. When you've gathered in your threshing floor and your wine press, in other words, when you've had the end of your harvest season, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you, your son and daughter and manservant and maidservant, the Levite and the stranger, even the stranger, foreigners who are with us, people of different races and backgrounds, were to honor them too, the stranger with you. And the, and the widows, take care of the widows who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast of the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you if we do these things, brethren, if we walk with God, He will bless us and bless us and bless us in every way. He will give us understanding. He will give us knowledge way beyond what this world has as they go further away from the way of God. Our families will be stronger. Our children will be stronger and cleaner. And then God will bring us into His kingdom. We will be the ones who are doing the work. We will get God's message out to this world and God will bless us. So if you keep these feasts, you will be blessed. And he will bless you in all the produce in all your work of your hands that you have set your hand to rejoice. Three times a year shall all your males appear, the three main seasons of the feast. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the spring, which of course includes Passover. In the Feast of Weeks, it's called the Feast of Pentecost. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, they shall not appear before the eternal empty or to bring generous offerings to God. And we're to have an offering tomorrow in the feast around the world because God commands that. So we have an offering on the first day and the last day. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the eternal your God which he's given you. So God tells us to do that and he tells us to give generously, to give our lives generously, our whole lives to God and he will bless us and guide us and be with us. So he tells us to observe these feasts and rejoice in the Feast of Tabernacles and he says, as I read to you earlier here, he says, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles and you shall rejoice. Verse 14, you, your son and daughter, everyone with you, seven days you shall keep the Feast of Tabernacles. He's going to place his name there. So we're told to come before God to worship God during this feast and the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Ingathering, or to rejoice in a special way. So I hope all of you will read the booklet that I wrote. I could give you a whole sermon just on that, but the vast majority of you know it. The Holy Days, God's Master Plan. If some of you new brethren have not read it, please get it. It's absolutely free. Study the booklet. It spells out every aspect of all seven of God's feasts. At the Feast of Tabernacles, we rejoice. And I hope all of you will rejoice, brethren, and really worship God during this feast. Learn to rejoice before Him and honor him during this Feast of Tabernacles. It's a wonderful time. How do you use your time during this feast? I think most of you know you're to spend extra time studying the Bible, drink in of God's Word every day, study it, be on your knees. Don't give up your prayer life, brethren, during the feast. Take time to pray. Get up each morning and get on both your knees and pray to God Almighty. Say, God, be with us, guide us, give us the right spirit, Help us to honor you. So we're to pray to God during this feast every day and walk with God. We're to meditate on God's word. 
and then we're to fellowship with one another. He tells us we're to rejoice. He shows that we're to be fellowshipping, loving one another, loving those around us, and helping build them in every way in a positive way. So we're to rejoice in this Feast of Tabernacles, and I hope all of you will certainly try to do that with all your heart, and we can have a wonderful feast around the world. Again, as we saw back in Zechariah 14, the time is coming, probably within the next 10 or 15 years or less, when Christ will come back as King of kings and Lord of lords, and all the world will be observing the Feast of Tabernacles. All the world, everybody will be observing the Feast of Tabernacles, brethren. So we want to do that. I hope all of you will learn to do it because we are pioneers. You're able to be a pioneer because God has called you and given you this opportunity. So I hope you will do that and do it with joy. And I hope we will try to do all our hearts to honor our Creator during this period of time. And God will bless us if we do. So study, take time to study, to pray, to meditate, and take time to spend time with your brethren, encourage one another, and rejoice in this feast and ask God's presence here. Lift up your hands to God each day and say, Father, pour out your Spirit on us. Help us to understand your Word better. Help us to worship you. Help us as a team to stay together and do your work and honor your name before Christ comes back as King of Kings. So let's do that, Father, and let's do that, brethren, with all of our hearts. And I know if we do, God will bless us forever. So say your prayers tonight, brethren. Say your prayers. And all of you have a good night's sleep. May God bless and guide you as you walk with him.